for Greg Hurst on the 5 and 6.30 editions of News 8. In fact, we weren't as innocent as we meant to be when we did the Martian broadcast. It was perhaps the most memorable radio program of all time. It was the work of a genius, but it created a panic beyond his wildest imagination. Our inside story for Thursday, October 20th, 1988. I'm John Tesh. And I'm Mary Hart. It was Halloween Eve and across America families tuned into a radio program to be entertained and wound up believing the nation had been invaded by spacemen from Mars. Our inside story for today. This time of year in Grover's Mill you see a lot of corn and the watermelons are ripe and ready for harvesting. Now not much out of the ordinary happens in this small farming community in central New Jersey. Except, on the night of October 30th, 1938, an army of Martians landed near this very pond, and hundreds of thousands of listeners heard about it firsthand on radio. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. The eyes are black, and they gleam like a serpent. The mouth is a kind of V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips. It seemed to oh, quiver and pulsate. And Monster, whatever it is, can hardly move. It was, of course, Orson Welles' radio recreation of H.G. Wells' classic sci-fi story, War of the Worlds. And for the citizens of Grover's Mill, it was a night to remember. Hank Sears grabbed his shotgun and broke the news to a bar full of farmers. You can imagine how Paul Revere said, right? Well, I, I don't think I should compare myself to Paul Revere, but I felt like that I was alerting somebody to an invasion, which is what I thought it was. Grandpa got up and started putting chairs under the door, under the doorknobs, and pulling the shades down. He was going to keep the Martians out that way. Lolly Dye was 16 years old, and on that Sunday night, she was in church. I couldn't be in a better place if this world is coming to the end, the Martians are coming, going to destroy us. I'm in the Lord's house. One tipsy farmer even shot at this water tower, thinking it was a Martian. New York, New Jersey. New York, New Jersey. Warning, poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. <laughs> William DiGiacomo was a young 30-year-old doctor who had just finished his rounds that night at St. Michael's Hospital in Newark. Well, there were about 50, 60, maybe 20 people outside all trying to rush into the hospital all at one time. And uh, utter confusion. The confusion spread from coast to coast. The next day, newspapers had a field day reporting that some one million Americans had actually believed the Martian invasion. Orson Welles was in hot water, but he insisted that he never meant to scare America half to death. I'm extremely surprised to learn that a story which has become familiar to children should have had such an immediate and profound effect upon radio listeners. Psychology professor Joel Cooper of Princeton teaches students the lessons of War of the Worlds. He believes listeners in 1938 were ready to be scared. People were feeling a sense of foreboding, a sense of anxiety, a sense of dread. The war in Europe was getting worse, was broadening. Uh, the economy was bad. Today, the people of Grover's Mill are getting ready to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the night the Martians came. They're selling souvenir hats, posters, coffee cups, even T-shirts. Next weekend, there'll be a big party. We are inviting everyone who wishes to come, um, and Martians are especially invited. However, we have established um, special parking restrictions on spaceships. There's also a War of the Worlds commemorative song produced by local musician Tom Marolda. And what will folks do the next time the Martians land? I would run like hell, but not for my shotgun. I'd run for my camera. I want to meet somebody from a different planet. Guess attitudes have changed. The fear and near panic created by War of the Worlds happened in spite of announcements before, during, and after the broadcast that the attack from outer space was fantasy and not fact. Later, the CBS network apologized to its listeners and to the Federal Communications Commission and said it would no longer use simulated news broadcasts as part of dramatic programs. The fear subsided, subsided in the days following that radio drama, but War of the Worlds never really left America's consciousness. It's been with us ever since, and now there are modern revivals in several forms. 
In 1988, War of the Worlds is proving to be just as popular as ever. We all saw some fairly extraordinary phenomenon, Colonel. I don't believe in ghosts, and I sure as hell don't believe in aliens from another planet. The 90-year-old H.G. Wells novel and 50-year-old Orson Welles radio broadcast, not to mention the 35-year-old Hollywood movie, have spun off a brand new syndicated TV series. It's kind of the major story of the 20th century. I mean, after we get our, our problems with nuclear warfare and feeding people and prejudice and hatred out of the way and all those things which are kind of holding us down as a species, we're going to pack our bags and go into space. And this is the story about that. A novelization of the two-hour premiere episode is also available to hardcore fans. How does this compare to Star Wars? Please. It's all too evident these creatures have scientific knowledge far in advance of our own. Jason Robards heads the cast of this recreation of the infamous broadcast produced for public radio. Rather than standing around a microphone, the cast was asked to act out their parts, and scenes that took place outside were taped outdoors to increase the realism and dramatic effect of the production. It will air, naturally, on Halloween Eve. I have nothing more to say at this Even the English have joined the War of the World celebration. The BBC has produced a documentary, Invasion from Mars, that will debut Halloween nights on cable's Discovery Channel. In fact, we weren't as innocent as we meant to be when we did the Martian broadcast. People, you know, do suspect what they read in the newspapers and what people tell them, but when the radio came, and I suppose now television, anything that came through that new machine was believed. And as we continue today, they call him Mr. Excitement. His dynamic stage presence had a profound effect on three generations.